Hey everyone, Happy New Year, and welcome to session 72 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Behavior University, where they bring you university level professional development in a convenient online format. For more information about them, you can head on over to behavioral, excuse me, behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations, where you can pick up a 10% discount using the coupon code podcast, and we'll hear more from them later. We're also brought to you today by the Himalaya podcast app. If you are frustrated, oftentimes rightfully so, by the native podcast players that come with your Android or Apple device, uh, worry no more. You can go to uh, the show notes of this episode at behavioralobservations.com and uh, look for the links that will uh, help you download the Himalaya podcast player app. So if you end up doing so, make sure you follow the Behavioral Observations podcast. All right, on to today's episode. I am thrilled to be joined by Bridget Taylor of the Alpine Learning Group. And for those of you who have read um, Let Me Hear Your Voice, uh, her work is uh, featured quite a bit in that book, as well as Devin Sunberg from the Behavior Analysis Center for Autism, uh, as well as the Women in Behavior Analysis Conference and uh, we will be talking about Weba uh, quite a bit in this episode. Uh, we'll be talking about you know why it was formed in the first place and what people can expect at the event itself. Um, the event is sold out right now, but I will have links to the registration page in the show notes for this episode. And if you're still interested in attending, I would check that page because they might be opening up more tickets if there are cancellations and things like that. So um, I would, uh, again, check that out there and I'll have the link at behavioralobservations.com and just look for session 72. Um, In this episode, we also segue into Bridget's recent work on uh, training behavior analysis practitioners to be more compassionate as they uh, deliver their services, a very, very important topic. And I think you're going to learn a lot. Uh, And along the way, we um, mentioned uh, a a few resources and articles here and there, and I will have those in the show notes as well. And again, you can find that all at behavioralobservations.com. So let's get right to it. Please enjoy this fun conversation with Bridget and Devin. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Devin Sundberg and Bridget Taylor, welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast. Hi, thank you for having us. Great to be here. Now the pleasure's mine. Wow, we've got quite a what an agenda to, to cover here. We're going to be talking about uh, the Women in Behavior Analysis Conference and uh, talking about some of uh, your work, uh, Bridget, in you know, some of your recent work in underscoring the importance of training practitioners to be more compassionate in their work. You know, it's an article that I uh, j- just read recently that you guys were uh, helpful enough to supply for me to check out. And I think it's probably mandatory reading for all practitioners. The more I, the deeper I got in the article, the more I enjoyed it. And the more I, I, I really th- thought it was important for us to review as a field. And we'll get into all that stuff in just a second, of course. And we'll have that article also available in the show notes. But let's start this episode the way we always do. So, um, Bridget, I'd like to go to you first. You know, you your work has been kind of enshrined in this, you know, the, the, the book, Let Me Hear Your Voice. And it was like the first book that was given to me once I kind of got out of working in institutions and started working in homes with families and things like that. My my boss was like, here, just read this, you know. So and, and, and not to not to say that that was the 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 uh, I guess the uh, apex of your career, of course. I mean that book has been published for years now, and I know you've gone on to do you know many many other things. But uh, tell us a little bit about how you got into behavior analysis, uh, and um, also I'm, it's kind of a side question. I'm really interested in about how being kind of uh, documented in Catherine Maurice's book like that. Uh, also affected you. So if you can kind of walk us through a little bit of that, that would be a fun place to start. Sure. Um, Well, you know, 
It's uh, It's been an interesting journey for me, for sure. I have a brother who has Down syndrome, and so he's younger than me. And I spent a lot of my early years, you know, working with him. And, and um, he was a real central, pivotal part of our family. And really, uh, I think, got me hooked onto this idea of working with people who are different and working with people who have, dis- who have disabilities. And, you know, he, I like to say that he taught me a lot about extinction in my early days <laughs> as a teenager, you know, he had a lot of fun behaviors, uh, and, uh, you know, he, he's a real character. So he was a, a, an inspiration for me to start working with people with disabilities from a very young age. And I never really had the traditional, jobs, you know, my friends had as waitresses and working, uh, you know, doing different things. So I started working with kids from a really young age and then started working in group homes and various programs for people with disabilities. And um, I had my first experience working with a group that uh, provided respite care to people with autism. And at the time, I, of course, knew very little. I was, you know, I don't know, 19, 20. And uh, I signed up to work at this respite care program, and they provided some rudimentary training using the Me Book, which back then was, you know, the, the first manualized book for working with people with autism by Ivar Lovas. And, uh, you know, the trainer sat us down and we did role play on how to do discrete trial instruction with kids with autism and, you know, the principles of reinforcement and extinction and so on. And uh, through that training, just started working with kids and was assigned my first child with autism. His name was Jeffrey. And um, he we just started doing what the trainer taught me, which was ask the child to do something, show him how to do it, provide a reinforcer. And I was hooked and fell in love and fell in love with the science of behavior and fell in love with Jeffrey and fell in love with working with kids and really just saw the power and the impact that behavior analysis can have. And I knew very, very little back then. I was so naive about it, you know the science, but really just got hooked on, on changing behavior and helping kids learn and seeing the changes in Jeffrey and the changes in the family and really being inspired and motivated to continue to understand more about the discipline and and its impact um, that it can have. Bridget, can and I, I, oh, sure. can, it occurred to me that uh, as you were describing that early experience there, that I think a lot of the listeners who are listening to this show right now probably don't have a perspective about how unusual that opportunity might have been at that point in time. Can you talk about the unique aspect of, or the, I guess, how rare behavior analysis was, particularly in that day, you know, like these days, it's a, a uh, uh, almost like an embarrassment of riches, right? You know, uh, anyone who's on the behavior analysis certification boards list, um, email list gets solicited for jobs many, many times a week and things like that. And, but that was back in, you know, what we might consider the wild and woolly days, not to use a, a clinical term, of course, but uh, so if yes. you could just spend a minute, just describe, I, I'm always interested in communicating kind of the ho- historical aspect of our practice, uh, given that meant the large majority of people these days uh, yeah. only good, know good what they know point. now. Yeah. Good point. I mean, back then, Oh gosh. So that was around, you know, 86, 87. Um, and yeah, there, (laughs) there was, uh, very little, uh, you know, Ivar Lovas's seminal study came out in 87 and the, you know, so, so there weren't, there was no concept of the BACB. Um, there were, uh, families, you know, really didn't know about behavior analysis. It, it was something that was in the journals, of course, but um, nobody was doing home programming. Very few programs, of course, uh, the, uh, you know, the low boss clinic at UCLA at the time. But there, it just people were not it was not as available, was not known. And uh, there certainly were not training programs in university. There were very few programs at the time. So, um, yeah, I felt very fortunate. I look back now and I feel very fortunate that the rudimentary training that I had back at that uh, workshop on how to, you know, implement discrete trial instruction was, you know, for its time, actually, uh, you know, the principles are the same as they are today, really, the principles of reinforcement, right? So I feel very fortunate that I had an opportunity to learn some pretty basic skills early on in my career, which then, um, you know, 
cer- certainly enabled me to, to make some changes with kids, uh, you know, of course, back then in a somewhat rudimentary basis. But yeah, the field had not, you know, we, we knew so little back then, of course, in terms of uh, working with kids in their homes. And so uh, there wasn't very little, you know, to your point. For sure. Yeah. Uh, and of course, I interrupted your your kind of story arc. To, to So, uh, you know, yeah, obviously no you, yeah. you got some initial training. Um, you got some. So you I got, got some initial training and, and started to uh, work with children in their homes and uh, saw the changes and the families saw the changes that the children were making and decided they didn't want to send their children uh, back to the public schools, a few of the children that I were, that was working with, and they decided to, uh, with several families, decided to start a school, and that started at the time, co-founded the program with uh, another colleague named Linda Meyer, and we, uh, myself and her, and two other uh, two families, founding families, we started uh, our school program that I currently have, I, I direct now, and it's a treatment center, and and it's you know. 30 years. We just celebrated our 30th anniversary. I can't believe it. Wow, congratulations. So, um, but on the way to that, I realized I needed to educate myself more. So I entered the uh, master's program in education at Columbia University. And again, I knew very little about the direction to go in learning about behavior analysis. And so I entered a special education program. And how I eventually found uh, myself involved in the the story of Let Me Hear Your Voice is, ironically, I was on an elevator going to class, and two people in the elevator were talking about a a job posting in the job ad center, in the the career uh, center, and it was for a therapist to do LOVAS therapy with a child with autism. And so I knew I had training in LOVAS, quote, LOVAS techniques, because what did I know back then? It was just from this book, the me book. And I thought, well, I had training in that, and I'm going to go and find out what this job posting is. And sure enough, on the wall of this career center was a, a job posting for someone to work with a child with autism. And I took, you know, I took the, the number off the wall, and I called, and that began my <laughs> my uh, my work with the family of uh, that that uh, you know Captain Maurice you know the the book Let Me Hear Your Voice. And, and so that must have been kind of strange seeing your. I mean, it's uh, to be completely candid here. It's been years since I've read the book, but obviously she chronicles all the work that uh, that. Well, I, I think the journey to finding behavior analysis, I think, was was. I think the part that struck me the most, but obviously the work that, that you and others did with, with her children. Um, how, what was that like to kind of see your own work kind of chronicled in that way? Well, you know, there was certainly a little, uh, somewhat of a, I, there, there was a degree of naivete in knowing just how impactful this book would be for families. So, um, you know, I started working with Anne Marie in the book, and she, there was a team of people involved, and there were, you know, speech and language pathologists, and behavior analysts, and you know, the team of the all of us really worked very hard with this little girl. And so, the changes that we were able to see take place, and then documented in the book, it was you know quite profound to read the story, of course. Um, once it was published, but I think for me, the I was very unaware of what the impact the impact that this book would have, and and so what started happening after the book was published is people would families would contact me, and of course, because the two children in the book really responded well to treatment and lost their subsequently lost their diagnosis as a result of you know a very intensive program. Families were calling all the time, wanting me to see their children and come you know travel all over and. And um, it was quite, uh, it was, a felt, I felt there was a degree of responsibility that I was not prepared for, that um, there was some heartache involved in that, of course, too, because you want every child to do well. And what we know is that autism is a spectrum and children respond differentially to treatment. And so um, there was this kind of somewhat daunting feeling of responsibility once the book was published and families started contacting me because, you know, at the time, uh, behavior analysis was a commodity and people couldn't get it and access it. And and they didn't know how to get the kind of treatment that the children in the book had. And so my phone was ringing off the hook for a couple of years after that book was uh, published. And uh, so so it was, uh, I mean, an, an incredible experience. It certainly taught me a lot about 
you know, being involved with those those children taught me a lot about the power of the methodology because, it, you know, they made such tremendous progress and they responded so wonderfully to treatment that the next child that I worked with, I worked even harder with because I saw the, I knew the power and the potential of the methodology. So it was uh, an experience to be certainly to to be part of that book, but there was also a kind of a daunting responsibility associated with it once it was published. I see. I see. Are you in need of continuing education? Well, Behavior University is a BACB-approved continuing ed provider, and their mission is to provide university-quality courses and ABA for new and experienced professionals alike. Their live webinars generally have a limited number of attendees so that the learning experience is highly interactive. And if you can't make the live events, these webinars are recorded and available in Behavior University's CEU library for later viewing. Behavior University also has a 40-hour RBT training. This self-paced course uses a combination of visual presentation, audio lectures, and live video models to teach all areas of the RBT task list. The course is accessible anytime and from anywhere. So if you'd like to learn more, head on over to behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations, where you'll find a 10% discount for podcast listeners. Again, that's behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations. And thanks for checking them out. Well, I could go on and ask you questions about that uh, probably indefinitely, but I know we, we have some other topics to get to. Um, Devin, I want to turn to you for a minute um, and talk about how you got into behavior analysis, what you're doing now. We had a chance to meet while out in uh, Indianapolis at HABA. Uh, yes, yes, folks, that's another HABA reference. I think I've referenced HABA like a, <laughs> your fif- new favorite conference 15 times since coming back from, from Indy. Yeah. Um, but, um, Besides Weba, of course. Well, yeah, well, <laughs> that's right. I well, sorry, we got to stay on brand, right? Stay on message. Yeah. So let, let's go. Let's, let's hear about it. Too. Um, so how I got in the field, I absolutely love hearing Bridget's story. And it just kind of ties back into um, one reason that we organized Weba. But um, I came into the field for love with people with special needs, and in particular autism. Um, I answered an ad in a paper. I love saying that because I think no one does that anymore. Um, But back then we used to find jobs by looking in the ad section in the paper. And um, a group in Indianapolis was hiring for uh, an ABA therapist um, doing therapy with children with autism. And I didn't know what ABA therapy was, um, but I loved my kiddos with autism. Um, So I answered that ad and, um, it was great. It was a parent run center. Um, I took that job in 2003, um, and just fell in love with the science because, um, being in a group home setting before working with those kids and having no effective tools. Um, they asked you to treat some behavior and, um, do some interventions, but, um, they didn't give you any means of doing it. Um, so it just seems like a lot of busy work. Um, so just being introduced to behavior analysis and seeing how, how much common sense it made. Um, I just loved it. Um, so, and that's also where I met my husband, Carl Sundberg. And eventually in 2009, we started the behavior analysis center for autism and, uh, through, about 10 year period, we had three daughters. So I've had the experience of trying to be a good parent while also trying to be a good professional. Um, and it's absolutely from that, that I found a a niche for a women's conference, um, trying to make it all happen. Um, so I feel like it's just a gift to be able to have these opportunities and organize that event that I feel like so many people have the same questions that I do and I get to meet these fabulous people like Bridget and I love hearing her story, um, and getting to share those stories with, um, all the women in the field, um, and other people just looking for guidance as well. So we've, we've mentioned the conference a couple of times. Uh, so for those who might not be aware of it, let's talk about Weba more specifically, um, how you made a kind of a passing reference to the, the motivation to start it, but I'm sure there's probably a little bit more to it than that. And then also uh, how that vision developed and kind of where the conference is now. So if you can kind of walk us through the background of Weba 
and, and bring us up to speed to where things stand in uh as we're kind of on the doorstep of uh, 2019. So this actually will probably be released in 2019. But uh, anyway, so can you walk us through that? Absolutely. Um, Actually, in 2016 or 2015, I forget, but I co-chaired your favorite conference, the HABA conference. Um, And through that, we, um, I worked with a colleague, Dr. Kim Soder Martel, and we had the idea of a theme of having all women speakers. And for whatever reason, um, we didn't go that direction, but that idea stuck with us. Um, we really enjoyed organizing that conference. Um, so I came back to Kim about six months later and I said, let's do it. Um, and it, it took a lot of convincing from uh, all the people that supported me, um, colleagues and my husband, because they thought, why a women's conference for a field that is so full of women? Um, everyone thought it was kind of silly. Um, so a, a good story. I reached out to a couple of people. I'm um, actually, I reached out to, to Dr. Vargas first to see if she would keynote and she is limiting some of her speaking engagements. So she, um, declined in such a lovely way. And, um, I reached out to Linda LeBlanc and, um, she said, yes, absolutely. That she would keynote our first conference in 2017 and um, it was then that I realized how much support the, the idea had from other women in the field. Um, and I am happy to do the work. And, and uh, so many people are overseeing this project and making it happen. And it's a part of going back and representing and supporting and celebrating the accomplishments of women who were not celebrated or did not get their fair share of recognition. Um, it's about highlighting current work like Bridget's work on compassion. And it's also about looking at topics that can make us better behavior analysts and better professionals. Um, so it, it's just a, been amazing. Um, we are getting ready to put on our third annual conference. And um, we like to hold it in Nashville every year. And this year it will be held on February 28th through March 2nd at the Omni. Cool. And I thought I saw something on social media this morning that uh, you guys are doing well with, uh, with ticket sales. Yes, the first year we had about 275 attendees in 2017. 2018, we had 400 attendees. In 2019, we will sell out at 600 attendees. Wow. Wow. So if you're listening to this right now and this is something that you want to check out, uh, where can people find more information? Our website is www.thebaca.com forward slash Weba, W-I-B-A. Cool. You know, Matt, I, I'd, like add, sure. I'd like to add. Sure. I'd like like to add. You know, it was such an honor to be invited to speak last year at the conference, and you know, I've been going to ABAI and various autism conferences for you know over twenty five years, and you know, I think what's happened in the field is that that over time, because we've become so big as a community, that it's been very hard to feel community at conferences often. And one of the things I was struck by at the conference last year at WEBA was was a real sense of community and a feeling of people really wanting to listen and talk to each other. And um, it was a sense of connection that I haven't felt in a really long time at a conference. And, you know, I, I, it, the mission, of course, is, is it speaks for itself. I mean, you know, who can argue with the mission of, of WEBA? And I think even though we're, we're a real female-dominated clinical Association. I mean, we we're primarily females. It's we, we're still underrepresented in so many ways, and so I just want to say that that besides the intellectual and scholarly content that one will uh, benefit from by going to the conferences, that I do think that the the, the sense of community and the and the, the discussions, the panel discussions, and the, the just the camaraderie that exists, and the shared sense of of concern for certain aspects and certain things that as a as a discipline that we're we're kind of universally concerned with, I think it's a it's a place to feel that that sense of community. Very cool, um, Bridget. I want to get to your uh, the the keynote that you're intending to to share at the conference in just a minute. But I I before doing that though, I want to spend just a little bit more time talking about the conference itself. Um, how is it? Uh, how is the conference set up, Devin? In terms of is it a 
Are there a bunch of different tracks going simultaneously? I mean, you've got 600 attendees, so I'm just in my mind trying to figure out like how, how that all works. And uh, so, so how, what, what, is the, yeah. what is the structure of it? Uh, this will be our first year with 600 attendees. And I'm feeling to, to keep that sense of community, like Bridget mentioned, um, I'm thinking this might be the, the, our stopping point, our, our sweet spot as far as um, how many attendees we like. But it is single track for our invited presenters um, during those presentations. And um, we will have six tracks of breakout sessions. Um, and sometimes we divide those into themes such as professional issues, women's issues, um, current research. Um, but we're kind of getting to the point where it's a little difficult to keep nice little tight tracks. Um, but our invited presenters this year, invited in keynote, are Shala Lai and Ramona Humanfar. And our invited presenters are Mark Batani and Carol Pilgrim. So this year we will have a real eye on diversity. Uh, Dr. Taylor, uh, we were so fortunate to have her last year. Uh, and that's when she presented on her compassion um, paper. Got it. Got it. And so... Um so you're going to cap this at 600. You think that that's the plan going forward? I think so. Well, I think that's all my, my, uh, stress level can take. I see. Yeah. I can imagine, uh, <laughs> can imagine there's, it's, it's a lot of, a uh, lot of hurting cats. You know, I've seen conference planning up close, uh, on a much smaller scale and, um, you know, you, the, with our, our local chapter uh, here in New Hampshire, and boy, pulling that off with a, uh, you know, twice the size and all that stuff. Do, do you feel that, I know at least in my neck of the woods up here in New England, um, it's, there's been a trend of our local conferences just kind of selling out. And, and so I've got two kind of contradictory thoughts about conferences. Uh, on the one hand, there's all these, seems to be many of these conferences, uh, whether they're local, you know, state uh, chapters or other types of um kind of non-affiliated ones popping up all over the place. And so there's part of me that thinks, okay, there's a lot of, I guess, inventory out there, a lot of opportunities for conferences. But on the other hand, I hear that when I hear that, you're, you know, you're going to sell out at 600, all the local conferences here in New England are, are selling out, you know, to capacity. And we're like, you know, trying to scratch our heads about, okay, well, how do we support this need for professional development? Where, where do you see, I, I have to imagine you guys have had to do some sort of market analysis of like the whole conference scene. What have you, what, what's your take on, I guess, the role of, of conferences and professional development? Um, and, and, and more so where do you, you know, uh, is, is there room for more uh, events like these more generally, whether they have to do with, you know, the, the, the Weeba mission or not? I'm just curious from a from a state of the practice type of uh, perspective and how these things shake out. I, I think I have in common so much with the um, average board certified behavior analyst. And for me, when you're trying to juggle your work responsibilities and any personal responsibilities. Um, a conference is fun, but you're, you're relieved of a little bit of guilt because it's work. <laughs> so I always feel better about going to a conference rather than going on a vacation. Um, but it's just a great time to, to learn, but to also relax a little bit. And, um, I absolutely think that there's uh, more space for for conferences like this, especially as our field gets so big. I mean, Bridget, you're the current president of the Behavior Analyst Certification Board, correct? I am. <laughs> <laughs> how many how many certified behavior analysts do we have now? I think it, oh, I, well, was it like sixty thousand, thirty thousand? Well, let me let me just pull up the number here. Hold on. Hold on. I yeah. just dropped something. It's in the tens of thousands. Um, yeah. So I, oh, think, yeah, yeah, I think when we published the compassion piece, what did we say? We're at, uh, let's see, 30,000 certified okay. behavior analysts. So, I need to get that right in case Jim Carr listens to this. That's okay. right. Yeah. I, oh, he, he does right listen, there, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I have it on good authority. Um, so just as our profession continues to grow and I think people need to, to feel 
like they belong um, and develop those connections. So I absolutely think that um, we could handle more conferences. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's just a uh, just kind of this. You know, again, not to get not to beat the the, the history horse, uh, but uh, I just you know having you know been a practitioner since the late nineties. You know, it's one of those things that uh, just to see the, the the field grow up and to have all these uh, events to go to. You know, um, for the longest time, you know, they were. You know, unless you lived in a very populous uh, state for behavior analysts like Florida or California or, you know, um, Kansas or, you know, Michigan or something like that, uh, it was it's hard to get good professional development without going to ABAI. Uh, it was kind of like the only game in town until some of the online stuff started to become more you know, user friendly and accessible enough. But, um, all right, cool. Well, thanks for taking a minute to elaborate on that. So, I want to get to this uh, th- this really neat paper on on uh, compassion, Bridget. And I apologize. I thought <laughs> I I thought that was something that you were presenting at the upcoming conference. And so um, that would make sense. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get we'll we'll do this in the right order next year, maybe. Uh, so um, so talk a little bit about that. You know, so you. Um, there's a really cool article that uh, that you had published in uh, Behavior Analysis and Practice. Uh, let's see. It was uh, written by you, Linda LeBlanc, and uh, Melissa uh, Nosek, um, talking about compassionate care and behavior analytic treatment. So, um, again, we'll have this paper linked up in the show notes, but can you give us kind of a an overview of some of these things, some of the, you know, the, some of the main yeah, themes that I you mean, guys wrote about? Yeah, so certainly a shout out to my co-authors who worked really hard on this piece with me as well, Linda LeBlanc and Melissa Nozick. Um, You know, I got interested in the area of compassion and empathy, really inspired by doing some reading on some Buddhist thinkers and theologians. You know, I started to think about my own personal experiences working with families and some of the challenges associated with parent adherence and And really feeling like going in and working with families, I often had an agenda, and that agenda often didn't match uh, what the families needed and feeling a sense of frustration over time with my own uh, inability to understand where families were coming from and and the perspective of parents. And and then working with young clinicians, uh, novice clinicians, clinicians who are in training to to be BCBAs and also teachers and, and, and anybody who's really interacting with families, I began to see over time that they too were struggling and often blaming families for their lack of adherence and um, really an- being unable to manage and handle anger expressed by parents and often shutting parents down when there was expressions of sadness and So watching clinicians uh, have this level of discomfort and also working with them on building skills in this area. And I started to talk to Linda, who's, you know, a friend and a colleague, and we started to to share similar stories about clinicians who were often blaming families for uh, their lack of participation and and um, really feeling like there was a lot of training and precision and technical skills. And there wasn't any training in in building relationships with families. And we, we, of course, as clinicians started to think about the essential work that needs to be done in this area. So the, the real, the basic premise of the paper is looking at whether uh, there needs to be training in this area and what other disciplines are doing. And so one of the initiatives, part of the paper was to send a survey to families to find out just how we are measuring up with respect to our relationship skills. And so, you know, we sent surveys out to just List serves. We didn't want to go to come directly from behavior analysts uh, to parents they were serving because we felt it would be biased. We didn't, you know, we didn't have a great return rate. We got about 99 families who completed the survey, and we felt it was enough to at least give us some of the uh, some look, looking at whether uh, you know how families were evaluating us, us with respect to compassion and relationship building skills. And you know, we found that there are some areas that we need some work in. Um, and, you know, we might be good at, you know, asking families uh, what, you know, whether they're going to consent to treatment, but we're really not doing a great job in terms of understanding their point of view and, and supporting them in, in some of the treatment initiatives. And so 
you know, this is this is kind of a long answer describing the paper, but you know, what one of the things that I think is important is that other disciplines see this as vital. And so medicine, palliative care, the areas of social work, psychology view the therapeutic relationship between patient and between doctor and patient as essential in promoting health outcomes and mental health outcomes. And so, you know, well, our, the work that we do with families are relational acts. You know, when we ask a family to implement a bedtime routine, that's a relational act. We are asking them to do something that we know will benefit their child, but there's a relationship involved in that tutelage and that, and that uh, mentoring and implementing that, that, that intervention. And so, if we are engaged in relational acts, it certainly makes sense that we that clinicians receive training in, in relationships building skills. And so based on the uh, what's being done in, in the other in other disciplines, it made sense that we began to look at this in, in behavior analysis. Nice. You know, I um, one of the things I liked about the paper is that you broke down a couple of different terms. I think it was like compassion, empathy and sympathy. And, uh, you know, if you were to ask me before I read the paper, I would all, I would say like kind of the, uh, the Venn diagram of those three concepts have a considerable amount of overlap, but you guys went through and as best as possible, uh, you know, given that these are constructs, right. Uh, um, gave a little bit more detail and, and teeth to them. Uh, and I thought that was a really neat aspect of the paper as well about, you know, different ways in which we can, um, I guess, uh, I, you know, feel towards the, uh, our, uh, you know, the, the, the folks that we work with. Um, yeah. And it just, uh, I think uh, underscores some of the, the work, uh, we need just, you know, on, on the one hand, I think this training is, is this type of information is vital for new practitioners to have. On the other hand, um, it seems that there are, there's a long list of, skills that, you know, new practitioners, uh, need to have, meaning that, you know, they're, you know, so I, I guess my question, like what, as a follow-up to that would be, you know, what, are, what are some ways and we can, uh, incorporate this into, into, you know, preparation of, of, uh, you know, BCBAs and things like that, you know, what, what are you, or, uh, are, are you aware of, um, preparation, uh, uh programs, uh, you know, um, at the university level, preparing people to uh, learn these skills? Well, you know, we know that they're in every medical school in North America, they, they now have a communication skills course. So uh, it's an actual course that, that's taught in, in medical school. We don't have that right now in, in behavior analysis. It's it's not part of the task list. It's not part of, you know, there's, there's no specific class in, in, in these skills. So, uh, as a follow-up to this paper, we sent a survey around to clinicians asking them about their training experiences. And for the most part, unless they had training as a psychologist or a social worker or some other discipline, they did not receive formal academic training in building in relationship skills. And so most of that, that training, most of the training falls to clinical sites or mentors who are providing supplemental training to clinicians at the work sites that they're employed. And so the training is not happening at a university level um, that we know of. And so I we, we mentioned the Pastrana article on uh, the most frequent articles assigned to behavior analysts as part of their graduate training, and not one in, is a relationship building or an empathy or compassion or therapeutic relationship building article. So what's being provided in terms of, of uh, scholarly papers to read, those aren't even included as, as scholarly papers to read. I see. So if it kind of falls on the shoulder of supervisors. That's correct. It would seem, at least at, at this point in time. Yeah. yeah. So we're going we're gonna, to uh, follow up with uh, another paper looking at train, uh, behavior analyst training experiences in that area. Cool. Look forward to seeing that. You know, some of the uh, interesting aspects of, of, of uh, that paper were, you know, some of the things that, you know, the survey results, things that uh, things that behavior analysts are currently doing well with. And then certainly there were some, frankly, disconcerting results in terms of if, uh, if memory serves. Uh, do you, um, are there any 
Are there any results that were uh, notable to you in terms of things that surprised you, either you know, um, in, in the, the positive or or you know, uh, a negative direction? Well, again, you know, limitation of the the size of the, the the pool of people who responded, but you know, generally some themes that we found were we seem to be doing well in celebrating child accomplishments, which I think is great. You know, letting families know. Um, how proud we are of our learners when they're accomplishing and sharing in that accomplishment with families and showing care about the child and appreciating the child's strengths. But we, you know, some of the things that came up, for example, were um, acknowledging their own mistakes, behavior analysts being able to acknowledge when they've made a mistake, um, reassuring, reassuring families that things will get better and, and really having an understanding of what it's like for a parent to have a child with autism. So, you know, we found some uh, that that there might be some work for us to do in those areas. You know, clarifying roles, um, communicating program changes more efficiently, and so families often feel that there's there's uh, you know we come in with our technical skills um, and don't really communicate the need or the necessity of certain changes that might take place in a child's program. So the um, you know there's a variety of things that we found um, that we might be doing well with, and then some things that that we could certainly use some work in. Yeah, I'm looking at some of the items that uh, items that may contribute to problems in the therapeutic relationship. You know, the the behavior analyst seems to have his or her own agenda. The behavior yeah. analyst under underestimates my child's ability. Uh, the behavior analyst focuses too much on my child's challenging behavior. The behavior analyst failed to communicate with me. So some of those things, you know, you know, and, and, and you know, obviously it, it, uh, it, this, it's the, the, it can be surprising, right? When it, you listen to it, you know, and then some ways it's not surprising, but it, for, for sure. Oh, I'm just reflecting on my own inter- interactions with, uh, with stakeholders. And I'm like, gosh, you know, it's, it's, it is, a, it is kind of a nice, mirror, I guess, to hold up to, to one's own practice and to be mindful of, of how you're interacting with folks, particularly under the circumstances where, where, where parents are, are under extraordinary amounts of duress. So, uh, anyway, I could, I, could I, I think, you know, I, you know, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but the, no. you know, I, I think the, I find a very common challenge in practice in working with families are clinicians inability to really sit comfortably with a parent's feeling of distress or anger or sadness. And so we, we so often want to jump to solution. And what I find over and over again, families just want to be heard. And often they just want to tell you how pissed off they are. Yeah, for sure. Am I allowed to say that word on a podcast? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. We've had, we've had <laughs> but, worse. We've had worse. Yeah. So, you know, I think sometimes uh, we err on the side of jumping to solution very quickly. And, you know, we want to kind of come out, we'll do a preference assessment, we'll do an FBA, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll jump right to solving the problem. And I, I think that is a good impulse on some level, but I think slowing some of that down and really sitting with families distress and, you know, reflecting back to them that what they're experiencing is okay. And as part of the process of working through identifying what's going to be helpful for their child and for them. One hundred percent. You know, uh, one, one, one of the first pieces of advice I got from uh, a really important mentor of mine, actually the same person who ha- put, let me hear your voice in, uh, <laughs> on my desk as well, uh, is that if you're doing work in the home setting, particularly if you are supporting a family who is, um, has, a, has a child who's engaged in a, who has a repertoire of many different challenging behaviors that you ask the parent what's the most important behavior to start with for them, even though you might, as a clinician, have different priorities. You, you, know, you might, you might uh, consider one particular target behavior more dangerous or, or more of a barrier to treatment or whatever, but if it's not aligned with the parents, then you're, you're starting off on the, on the wrong foot already. You know, and I always thought that that's advice I've, I've tried to uh, keep in mind working with uh, not just uh, families, but also teachers and things like that. If I'm doing behavioral consultation in a school setting, you know, what is what is the uh, and of course, this all kind of, I guess, lends itself to some, you know, social socially valid outcomes. Um, you know, one of the things I thought was cool in that paper, too, is that you guys reference some of the work that's being done in the ACT community, um, you know, if, um, and I think. Those are, you know, some of those themes were outlined by uh, an earlier interview I did with Jonathan Tarbox, you know, where he described how to, you know, um, 
you know, working with with parents in terms of uh, you know acceptance of the you know clearly aversive stimuli that might come through an extinction procedure, you know, but really spending a lot of time laying the groundwork for them to to participate and and to actually you know follow through with those types of interventions. Um, so yeah, and e- Evelyn Gould and uh, her article on using ACT with parents of children with autism is a really nice example of helping families understand the importance of their values and and the impact that that can have on on treatment acceptability and so on. And and I I appreciate that as a good example where you are taking into consideration how a family, how a parent actually feels in relationship to, to what they're actually doing with their, their child. Great. Um, well, I could go on and on extolling the virtues of this topic and, and this paper. And again, for folks who want to check it out, that will be in the show notes to this episode. But um, uh, as we're kind of uh, rounding the the final corner on our, on our time here, um, I want to get some, uh, I guess some some perspective on where you think the field is more generally. I know we've already talked about some of the historical aspects of it, but uh, you know where you think the field might be going, given you know um, uh, both the, both your different vantage points uh, in terms of um, you know, Devin. I know you're a you know n- not only a practitioner, but you're you're a business owner, and then now a a, a, a I guess a uh, a, a conference, uh, an event promoter, uh, or, mm-hmm. or organizer or whatever. Um, so let's, let's spend the last few minutes here talking about, you know, uh, what are some things that, that are going on in the field that you're really excited about and things that you you know, that you're excited about in terms of, uh, what the future holds for us uh, and not to be a downer, but what are some concerns that you have as well? So, uh, Devin, why don't you, uh, why don't you take a, a start at that one? Oh, goodness. Um, some things that I'm really feeling positive about as a, a company owner are our CPT codes. Um, it was really great to go out and uh, I got to see Alpine Learning Group, um, which is just amazing. And it blows my mind that Bridget's been doing that for 30 years um, as our um, behavior therapy company has been going on for nine years. And oh my goodness. Um, but being accepted by the medical community at large um, will be huge for us. And so I'm really excited to see that the CPT codes be adopted as permanent codes. Um, Some things that I'm concerned about, and and Bridget and I had the opportunity to discuss this a little bit during our visit, um, is how we are on the, um, we're looked at as prime investment opportunities. So anytime um, from venture capitalists, so anytime, um, you know, you're seen as a way to, to make money, I have concerns about the clinical integrity um, and maintaining that. Uh, I think even some behavior analysts don't know how, how much, how complicated um, what we do really is. Um, and, and I think sometimes it can be oversimplified to just needing a, um, board certified behavior analyst and a technician to provide good therapy. And it's so much more than that. And I can see that in um, Bridget's model at the Alpine Learning Group as well. It's just clinically rigorous. Um, and I'm concerned that some of the, the investors coming into our community won't appreciate that. I see. I see. Yeah, good points. You know, it's interesting that, uh, the again, the, the development and the growing up of our field that uh, there are all these kind of business related topics become a, a you know a, a more of a stable feature to a lot of our conference events. You know, not only the emphasis on OBM, which obviously is crucially uh, important, because at the end of the day, as BCBAs, we're directing the activities of others m- most of the time. Uh-huh. Uh, but also just the kind of nuts and bolts about you know. Uh, setting up payroll and making sure you have the right type of insurance and, and this, that, and the other thing. So the, 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 the it, uh, again, it's just another marker of, I guess, the development of, of, of where we're going. So, um, Bridget, what are your thoughts in terms of the, uh, you know, what, uh, things you're looking forward to as the field continues to mature as well as things that, uh, you know, we might need to be wary of. 
Well, I'm really I'm excited about the push for, uh, you know, diversity and inclusion. I think Weba is a good example of that. You know, I, uh, there's there's going to be a special issue coming out in behavior analysis and practice on diversity. And I think it's, you know, long overdue that our field looks at um, how there is a real lack of diversity. Just go to our conference and look around and see, you know, the color of the skin of everybody in the audience. And so we need we need some real focus in our field on on increasing diversity in our clinicians and at our, you know, in our universities. So I'm really excited that there's a, a there seems to be interest in that. I'm I'm uh, I'm always excited by applied research and the application of our of our principles to teach kids with autism all kinds of things. I think we're at a point where we're realizing the power of of the methodology. So so looking at new research always excites me. The um, the things that I'm concerned about, I certainly think uh, I echo what Devin is concerned about as well. I think that um, behavior analysts are sometimes very interested in being business owners and might forget why they got into the field to begin with. And I, I worry that clinicians may not have enough real um a long enough period of time. I, I call it chair time, really working individually with kids, a variety of kids who present with all kinds of complex issues over a long enough period of time. And so, you know, um, we can all agree that the that the VCBA is a is a is a standard. It's a, it, and in some cases, maybe a minimal standard for what we might want clinicians to be able to do long term. And um, so, I worry a little bit about uh, folks who want to become business owners and scale up their businesses uh, too fast, too soon, and so you lose that quality. And so, I I worry just a little bit about the people's lack of focus on what their what might have been their primary interest in, in the field. And I, I, I really encourage the clinicians that I work with and train to stay in contact with regularly with what their reinforcers are. And I worry that uh, economics sometimes drives the discipline. And I'm, I would like to see uh, all of us stay in contact with our reinforcers of shaping behavior, which is really what, um, you know, why, why at least it, the folks that I know and, and, um, colleagues that I share conversations with or got into the field with to begin with. Yeah. And I like that point about, you know, getting a, a broad base of training with a variety of different individuals with different presenting challenges as well, you know? And so if you're someone who's only done early intervention with, you know, preschoolers and younger, you know, um, and then you start a business and then all of a sudden you're getting referrals for, you know, adolescent kids with emotional behavioral disorders in school settings, you know, you don't have that uh, skill set, which is, and it is a different skill set for sure. So I think that's, that's certainly a neat point. I know we've made some parallels to, I guess, uh, you know, medical school training. I do wonder sometimes as, as our, you know, down the road would the field be, you know, better, increasingly better served by, you know, having, rotations through different types of settings as part of our um, supervision model. You know, I have a friend of mine who is a, is a medical doctor and uh, in his, in his um, medical school training, you know, they did various rotations after they, you know, after a couple of years of, of school, he, um, you know, had different rotations through different areas of the hospital essentially. And so he did some stuff in psychiatry, then he did some stuff with, uh, you know, in, in this department, in the ER and then elsewhere and, and things like that. And eventually, you know, I went, went on to specialize, but, you know, because of that training, he has a very broad, uh, um, you know, broad, broad area of experience to, to draw on. And of course there are a million things about medical training that we don't want to model. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, just kind of uh, something I think about from time to time. I think that's a good point in in that, um, you know, the training experience is often dictated by where the clinician is needed, right? So they might be assigned certain cases because that's what they're hired to do. And, you know, I think over time, our standard for training, of course, will improve. It's just natural that that will happen. And maybe... Um, you know, to your point that perhaps there are, that, that there might be rotation at, you know, types class, you know, working in different types of environments with different types of clients might be uh, something that over time might eventually evolve to. Yeah. Um, all right. So we're going to wrap up here in just a couple of minutes. 
Uh, Devin, is there anything else about Weba that you want to share with the audience? Um, this year, we're excited to offer free childcare. Very uh, on cool. site. Yeah. Um, so uh, there haven't been a lot of takers on it. And I think that it has so much to do with um, it's not just the child care. That's the, is the issue. It's the, the cost of travel to get everyone there um, to room everyone. So next year we hope to implement a scholarship that encompasses uh, more dollars for all the needs that go along with um, working professionals. That's Devin, amazing. I, I, did, I, mean, I just want you to also mention that you did provide scholarships this year that people. Don't yes. Have. Yeah. If you want, it might be nice to. Um, people are so supportive. Um, a lot of our speakers and leaders in the field are supportive of this effort. So a lot of times they will take um, portions of their speaking fee and put it towards um, scholarships. So this year we will a were able to offer 16 scholarships to students and professionals, um, to women of color and other diverse backgrounds. Very neat. And do you find the, the are, are the, most of the attendees uh, coming into Nashville specifically for the conference or are you drawing a lot of be behavior analysts and students of behavior analysis from the, from the local area, just out of curiosity? I'm a little of both. Um, I know Vanderbilt's right near there. So we do get a lot of students from Vanderbilt. Um, but the whole goal of having this in Nashville and not in my hometown, Indianapolis, is to make sure that people understand it's a national conference and a, a national and international effort. So we've actually attracted people um, from outside the United States as well. Very cool. All right. Um, and uh, so I will have the links to where you can find out more about Weba in the show notes for today's episode. Um, all right. So let's uh, let's end with some parting thoughts. I always at, try to conclude the interview with advice for the newly minted BCBA. I know we've already you guys have already dispensed tons of valuable advice, so it might be perfectly fine just to end where we are right now. But if there, there are other thoughts that you have. Uh, imagine uh, imagine you're chatting with someone who uh, literally just got the news that they passed the exam. I think as we're recording this right now, I think people are waiting on pins and needles for the uh, the magic email from the board. So um, advice for the newly minted practitioner. Well, if they're really newly minted, I'm going to say go out and have a cocktail. Yes, 100%. <laughs> Maybe two. So Mostly my staff, there's no good EO for good advice at that point. They're just like, get me at, you know, they didn't want to talk about behavior analysis at all. Well at said. That point. Yeah. But, you know, I think that um, I'm always encouraging staff to keep learning. It's not the end of the journey for them just because they have the certificate that they need to stay in contact with the research. They need to read regularly. Um, don't go to conferences just because you need CEUs. Go because there's someone that you've read an article by that you want to see speak live. Um, so really staying in touch with the literature and never stop learning and, and know what you don't know um, and seek consultation and advice. Know when to refer out and um, don't be afraid to uh, to, you know, let let others know what you don't know so that you can get better at what you do. And, and the journey's not over just because you have the certificate. You have to keep learning. Cool. Devin? Yeah. Uh, I would absolutely agree and echo what Bridget said. Um, part of my notes here says be humble. Um, and part of that is knowing when you are wrong. Um, and it's okay to admit that. And that's your time to learn. Um, for me, what's been key is having um, so much of a supportive supervisory group of colleagues around me that, um, especially for WEBA, Everybody wants to see this succeed and it wouldn't succeed um, and be sustainable without all the help that I've received from our advisory committee, from people like Bridget, um, the invited speakers uh, and other people in the field. Um, so it's always nice that when I need something that I know that I, I have a lot of people I can ask for help. All right. Great. Great place to end on. Again, it is. Uh, uh, let's see. We will uh, the the dot com forward slash Weba, and again we'll have that in the show notes. Um, Bridget and Devin, thanks for taking some time out this morning to uh, to chat with us on the Behavioral Observations Podcast. Thanks, Matt. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. 
You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast. <laughs>